Wellington himself was on hand at this crucial spot. His staff had already been killed and wounded around him, and Lord Uxbridge had advised him to take fewer risks. I will, he said, directly I see those fellows driven off. He gave the vital orders himself. Stand up, guards. Make ready, fire. At exactly this moment, the Prussian attack was also biting deep. And as the Imperial Guard fell back, the French army broke. Wellington stood up in his stirrups and waved his hat to signal a general advance. Napoleon's army was routed. Wellington's victory was absolute. It's true that Wellington was fighting an ailing Napoleon, whose genius was never fully displayed. It's also true that without the Prussians, there'd have been no victory. But this was always a coalition campaign, and Wellington fought here in the correct assumption that Blucher would support him. The Duke's real skill, and that wonderful quiet tenacity that contemporaries call bottom, was displayed up here that day. Cajoling, encouraging, gripping, directing keeping that oh-so-thin red line steady until the weight of the alliance could crush Napoleon. Waterloo was enshrined in British history. There was nothing quite on the scale of Trafalgar Square, but this great triumphal arch was built at Hyde Park Corner, and in due course, Waterloo Station, Waterloo Bridge, and scores of Waterloo roads celebrated the victory. Wellington himself was an international hero loaded with honours. Parliament voted him a huge sum to buy a 20,000 acre estate at Stratfield Say. He also purchased Apsley House here. The gratitude of the relieved monarchs and leaders of Europe knew no bounds. Wellington gets loaded with gifts by all sorts of states and individuals, and you've got quite a lot of them here. We've got an enormous number here at Apsley House. He was showered with porcelain services, with silver, with silver gilt. The sovereigns across Europe were so relieved that Napoleon had been defeated. And this is one of a pair of modest little candlesticks. Yes, these very splendid candelabra were presented to the Duke by the merchants and bankers of the City of London. Terrific detail. Extraordinary workmanship, huge scale, and wonderful iconography. And over here we've got these Field Marshal's battles. That's right. And I think I've ever seen as many in the same place. The rank of Field Marshal is the highest military rank an individual can attain, and he's got so many battles. It is an incredible thought that all these states have given him the highest rank in their armed forces. It's remarkable. Extraordinary statement. I think that just the quantity, this display speaks for itself. And then, of course, there were the pictures. That's right. The Spanish invited the Duke to keep 200 masterpieces, really wonderful works of art from their royal collection. Lasker's, Rubens, Bruegel's, they're really household names. So and of course, I'm particularly attracted by a picture which isn't part of the Spanish royal collection at all. I like this painting of one of the annual Waterloo banquets because it's got everybody who was anybody at Waterloo and has managed to survive since. In the centre is the Duke, on his right the King of England, and on his left the King of Holland. And people queued outside Apsley House to see who was coming. It excited great national interest. The guest lists were published in the papers and so on. It does seem to me to sum up the sheer opulence of all that Wellington had got hold of by this time honours, decorations, and this sort of adulation. Wellington's wife, Kitty, did not share in the Duke's public adulation. She was a shy, insular person who lived at home at Stratfield Say. Wellington had little interest in her. He was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Occupying Forces in France and was now at the centre of a glittering social world. The Duke was a charismatic man, and there were many opportunities for affairs. 
It was said that he even slept with two of Napoleon's mistresses, one of whom thought him a more vigorous lover than the emperor. But eventually, Wellington decided to limit his relations to the platonic. It was important to behave with decorum, and he would announce, I am the Duke of Wellington, and must do as the Duke of Wellington doth. Wellington started to see himself as a statesman. He spent three years working to establish a secure and stable Europe, free from the horrors of war. The Duke returned to England in 1818. He could have settled down to a very comfortable life, enjoying fame, glory and wealth. But he was a patrician with a powerful sense of duty and wanted to serve his country in peace as he had in war. And also, perhaps, he'd got so used to living in the limelight that he couldn't do without it now. Politics beckoned, and rightly or wrongly, he believed that he knew just what the country needed. But how well would the triumphant general transform into a political tactician? While traveling with his friend, the MP John Croker, the two men used to try to guess what kind of terrain lay on the other side of the hill. The Duke himself said, All the business of war, and indeed all the business of life, is to endeavour to find out what you do not know by what you do. That is what I call guessing what is on the other side of the hill. Wellington confidently presumed that he could guess what was on the other side of the hill for Britain and for British politics. And when he was offered a place in the Tory cabinet, he accepted. At his country estate at Stratfield Say, Wellington was able to consider his future political career. Living in the closed and comfortable world of the aristocracy, it must have been easy to be indifferent to the abject poverty not far from the gates of his mansion but Britain was in the throes of an industrial revolution. And elegant sites like this were increasingly set against a backcloth of upheaval and inexorable change. In the new, squalid, smoke-belching cities like Manchester, a working day was often 18 hours, and half of all children were dying of illness or malnutrition before the age of 10. Discontent turned into agitation, and visions of the French Revolution loomed large. The Tory government, in particular, declared its determination to avoid the horrors of revolution by clamping down firmly on any unrest. The Whig opposition, was prepared to countenance moderate political change, not because it really believed in it, but as a way of avoiding something far worse. Wellington was a natural Tory and was not ready for change. Not long after he took up his post, the authorities in Manchester sent in the cavalry to put down a demonstration in St. Peter's Fields demanding political reform. A dozen people were killed in what was known in parody of Waterloo as the Peterloo Massacre. Wellington was one of the 13 ministers who wrote an official letter supporting the magistrate's action. He had always believed in harsh punishment to maintain discipline amongst his troops. Likewise, he believed in the harshest repression of any public disorder. He feared the mob and the anarchy that would follow. He would announce to his friends, It is very clear to me that the radicals won't be quiet till a large number of them bite the dust. We are the nation in Europe the least to be trusted when we are not controlled by the strong arm of the law. Give the people a strong, a just, and if possible, a good government, but above all, a strong one. Wellington's priority was to maintain stability. 
It was perfectly natural for Wellington, a general, to see politics as simply the defence of the realm in another guise. Over the following years, Wellington acquitted himself well as a cabinet minister.